Hello, welcome to the Parenting Program Show. I am your host, Jeremy, the Kung Fu Guy. I am a force of nature married to another force of nature. Her name is Autumn. And we have two amazing explosive balls of energy called kids. I am a speaker, teacher, author, catalyst, and Kung Fu master here to help you empower your kids to speak up and own their voice. We're going to unlock and remove the chains of childhood that seem to hold us from our destiny with the tools to have inner strength, confidence to speak up, be heard, and be understood. Let's go play. Game on, yo. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today on the Parenting Program podcast show. Today, we are joined by Dr. Russell Kennedy, neuroscientist, University of Victoria, 1987, medical doctor, University of Western Ontario, 1991, corporate speaker and entertainer since 1999, and certified yoga teacher. But more importantly than all of his professional accolades are his personal qualifications. Dr. Russell Kennedy also calls himself the anxiety MD because he has lived with anxiety for most of his life, and he's devoted his career to helping others out of the hole he was in for a very long time. He believes there is no better teacher than one who has been where you are now and found a way out. His anxiety started when he was quite young, as he grew up with a severely mentally ill father who would lapse into psychotic depression and anxiety that would frighten him to the point that he developed an anxiety disorder. Today, you're going to want to listen in. We're talking about strategies to help your children, help yourself be more centered, have more fun, get past the anxiety and the fear. What can you do to make your life different for you and your kids as we go into 2020? As I like to say, 2020 is the year to work on your perfect vision. And let's go live to the call. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the parenting program. I am your host, Jeremy, the Kung Fu Guy, and I'm excited today to be joined by Dr. Russell Kennedy. And we're going to be talking about, you know, first, Happy New Year tomorrow, because today is New Year's Eve. I want to say thank you for joining us and give you something to think about for you, for your kids, as you roll into the new year, new plans, new excitement, change. Some people, they ride those changes like a surfboard, and some people get planted by the wave. So we're going to talk a little bit today about how we're going to manage that unknown, how we're going to start building some more certainty around our lives and gain some more clarity about new things we can do in 2020 to make it really the best year of our life. And so uh, without further ado, let's get to Dr. Russell. Hey. <laughs> how you doing, sir? Good to be here. Happy almost new year. Yeah, so um, I just did your bio a second ago with the with the uh, with the things floating around. Could you give everyone just in your own words like a two minute? Who is Dr. Russell Kennedy and what's he all about? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, got a degree in neuroscience. I have master's level training in developmental psychology. I'm a yoga and meditation teacher, and I was a professional stand up comic for ten years. So my specialty is anxiety. I grew up with a father who was schizophrenic. So. In my youth, there wasn't a whole lot of certainty coming down the pipe for me. So I got to learn how to read other people really well. But the problem with putting all my energy into reading other people was that I left myself and then I developed an anxiety disorder on top of that. So I call myself the anxiety MD. That's the best way to find me. If you Google the anxiety MD, you can find me anywhere. But uh, anxiety is my specialty. It's my jam. It's uh, I probably know more about anxiety from more perspectives than anyone else in the world. So here I am and I'm ready to go. I love that confidence and that clarity and to just own it because so many people get, they get wrapped up in labels and identities and then they become, it becomes this source of fear or it becomes some sort of an attachment. You're just kind of like shrug your shoulders. It's a thing and let's just go on. And I love that, that confidence. And for those of you playing along at home, I actually met uh, Dr. Kennedy in one of the men's groups that I'm in. I believe it was man talks and sharing some content back and forth, really appreciate the way his mind works. And you know, a lot of things we're in parody on, even coming from different backgrounds and different experiences. And so um, today what I want to talk about really was, you know, as we're gearing into 2020, and a lot of people are thinking about New Year's resolutions, they're thinking about new opportunities, you know, it's a new season, it's a new decade, it's all these new things. And that sounds exciting, but for some people, it can be overwhelming, it can be nerve-wracking, it can be scary. So um, Russ, if you could just take us through, you know, how should parents begin to start talking with their kids as we look at setting up goals and setting up things for the new year? There's so much pressure on that. So what would you say to your parents if the kids are getting a little worked up or a little bit stressed out about New Year's plans and, and it's a new decade and all the things I just said? They're like, oh my gosh, that, that's not exciting. It's, it's depleting. Yeah, yeah. The kids really feel it. And they feel your stress too as a parent. You know, they're very 
they're sponges. You know, when I was younger, I would really felt my dad and I could tell when he was starting to go off. So they're very, very sensitive to your energy. So the more you can ground yourself, you know, get into breathing, put your hand on your chest, connect with yourself. But it's really, you know, using their social engagement system to their advantage, because a lot of times it's not so much what we think, it's how we feel. It's, it's the, the autonomic nervous system. It's that fight or flight nervous system that, that goes off. And I know I was a sensitive child. I know a lot of the kids in, 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 that I see in my practice and, uh, are sensitive, you know, and, and there's a lot of reasons why they're more sensitive than they were 20 years ago. And I think we're going to talk about that, too, just that we're losing this social engagement system of the brain, which involves, you know, tone of voice, body language, this eye contact, which is so, we're losing eye contact with our kids so much now. And the kids are unable to really read us because they don't have the practice. They're on their screens so much. They don't have that one-to-one sort of calm, centered, you know, play time that we need to connect with each other that, you know, matures that part of our brain. So I guess it's just making a commitment to connecting with your child face-to-face and really making a commitment to play because play is what changes our brain. Playing, play is what really makes the difference and allows things to integrate into our, our brain. We can learn all the stuff we want, but play and incorporating the body, like I, I know with you in martial arts, when you use that somatosensory cortex, when you use that part of your brain that's involved in motion, we're meant to move. And when you move at the same time as, as sort of feeling, you start creating a new program. And I think with the kids, they're being so stationary these days, you know, sitting in front of a screen, they're not moving, they're not engaging that thing. And the, and the brain is meant to be engaged. It's meant to sort of have all sorts of, you know, uh, activity in, in very different parts. And if they're getting the same activity in the same parts all the time, they, those parts get really well, you know, practiced. But the other parts, you know, like the parts that in, involve us being connected to one another, start to atrophy. And that's a really dangerous thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, so if I could, if I could regurgitate that slightly, I heard you say a couple things in there. One is they got to work on their people reading skills. They got to work on by by practicing and engaging. Uh, number two, mom and dad, if you are more centered, more stable, and more engaged with your kids, that will help them to feel more stable, more secure, and more engaged with the world around them. And then number three, get them up and get moving. Interactive type stuff, playing, experimenting, exploring. Because what you just said, you know, we do. As a, as a society, sit down, shut up, quit moving, quit talking, quit yelling, quit asking, quit, 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 quit. We put all these limitations on our kids and then we wonder why they don't take initiative. Why aren't they self-starters? Because they're being browbeat into these little round shapes and just stop. Yeah, and then when you do that to kids, basically that's when you'll start getting a attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity, because the pendulum's always gotta swing the other way. Mm -hmm. So if they're not getting enough stimulation in the right way, they'll look for it. Their brain will create it in the wrong way. So it will make them hyperactive. It will make them, you know, you, you watch these kids who are, who are hyperactive and even in their, in their thought, and it's very, you know, staccato. It's like the, the movements aren't smooth. They're not rhythmic. They're, like, you know, if you look at your breath, you know, it's a very rhythmic kind of in and out kind of process. And that's what I try and mimic with, with my kids is I sit, I sit with them and, and we try and make eye contact knowing you know eye contact with kids is a really delicate situation because when you make eye contact with them you're you're speaking directly into their their social engagement system and if they're connected if they're in their parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system you'll find that they won't have too much of a problem maintaining your eye contact but if they're in fight or flight our brains are designed to go into survival mode so when you're in survival mode you know when you're talking to a kid who's in fight or flight, he won't be able to meet your eye because he's looking over your shoulder. He's actually looking for threat is what he's looking for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you being the connected version of yourself is not actually what they're looking for in that particular situation. They are, but their brain makes them sort of look for danger, you know, because there is this dissonance in their bodies when they feel all this energy that they're in danger in somehow. So you have to sort of come up to that, you know, make eye contact with them slowly. Tone of voice is really important. Prosody in your voice, moving it up and down. I know as a stand-up comic, it was so important for me to go up and, and change the tone of my voice. Because you'll notice people who are new stand-up comics, and I used to do a, a, an open mic with a lot of new stand-up comics, and they would go up there and they're like, hey, how is everyone doing tonight? Okay, I went to the store, you know, and it's this monotone, and then we are... 
when it when things are monotone when we have these low frequencies it signals alarm in us so we really that that moving your voice up and down that making easy eye contact not forcing them to do it but inviting them to do it and then doing it in play as soon as you get into play you put you put them in the parasympathetic you put them into this state where they're having fun and when they're having fun then they'll connect with you so it's you know and it's all this stuff that we're not doing now especially like therapy and that kind of thing too they're they're moving towards it like they're really starting to see the role of play in children in in, in in allowing them to relax and how important it is but it's it's a long time coming yeah there's a there's a great meme that's like you know when kids come home from a stressful day they don't say hey do you want to talk or hey give me a hug they ask do you want to play yeah. and that is their invitation really kids want to connect yeah and once they've got that connection now they start to feel secure they start to feel safe they can relax they can because they now they kind of quote unquote know their place it's they have that sense of belonging and and really we as adults going into the new year really need to be intentional about creating those connections absolutely i know it with my i have um one daughter who's 34 who's just had a baby 18 months ago and is having another baby next month so i'm going to be a grandfather for the second time congratulations I yeah i have two stepsons one who's 21 one who's 15 and it, it is one of those issues where you, the more you get to connect with them um, because I've known them now for about six years. I've been kind of the stepdad. The, the older one is kind of like, he. I got him when he was about 15 or 16. So he's not as connected to me as when I, the 15 year old who I got as a nine year old. You know, But what we do every day when we pick him up from school, if I get him that day, is we go through the four agreements. You know, where did you do your best? You know, where did you make assumptions? That kind of, we sort of, we go through all four agreements and they, how did that, and we do it within two minutes. And it's been one of the best, I've been doing it with him since we've been, he's been about 11 years old. And it's one of the best things that I've ever come up with because it engages him to talk about, okay, I tried my best at this and I didn't do as well. I made an assumption that these girls were talking about me. I don't know if that's true. So it's, it, it, it was the four agreements was one of the best things that I've ever I've ever encountered as far as, you know, raising my stepson, mm -hmm. because it's something we can do now inside of two minutes. And then the other thing I try and I get them to do every night is we only do about two minutes of meditation. That's it. Because kids, you know, have a hard time with it. Sometimes he'll ask me to do it. Um, but usually every night we'll go through the four agreements when I pick them up and then at, at bedtime and then uh, I'll do about a minute or so of meditation because they don't get any downtime with their brain. And, you know, it, it really helps him a lot because he'll bring it up. The other day he said to me, you know, I went around, he's a basketball player. So I went around this, he was playing against a senior team in practice. I went around this guy and then scored a layup and, and he kicked me after. And he said, but I, I didn't take it personally, which is one of the four agreements, don't take anything personally. I didn't take it personally. I knew it had, had said more about him than it did about me. And he's 15, right? So right. stuff gets in. Like yes, this stuff it does. Yeah. They're, they're listening. Kids are always, there's a great quote I have, which is don't worry your kids are listening. Be afraid they're always watching, but they're absorbing everything we're doing, what we say, how we act, how we react. They're filing all that stuff away because that becomes their model to bounce off of, to build how they operate. Yeah. And the more we can get them to take ownership of that, the better it's going to be on everybody over time. I'm checking so, to see if there's questions. Uh, oh yeah, I'm just looking through my notes because I had some stuff prearranged. So, um, so what should what should a parent do if you know we've got a high stress kid, a high sensitive kid? Even that the label is my kid high strung? Is my kid sensitive? Are they you know here here in the U.S. ADD ADHD is diagnosed oh. left and right? And yeah. I, just, I just posted an article that came out talking about our our boys especially overdiagnosed because it's like. The actual diagnosis of ADHD is like a multiple visit sequence with a pediatrician, interviews with teachers, interviews with parents. It's like this long drawn out process, not a 15 minute, yeah, he is drug him. And, but yeah. there's doctors that do that. So, so even, could you just explore that a little bit? Like, like the power of the label we give our kids and how that influences yeah. them. Yeah, well, you know, here's, here's the thing about medical doctors and I am one, so it's one of those things. When you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. So we are trained in a pharmaceutical model, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So we get comfortable with this idea that we can induce a change with medication, and often we can, but at what cost a lot of the times? And, you know, I specialize in anxiety, so I, I you know, I, 
I really try and move away from antidepressants if I can, because a lot of the stuff that, that I deal with is from childhood trauma. It's from, mm. from parents who weren't able to link with their own children for whatever reason when they were younger. So I guess it's really, it really comes down to um, being afraid, not afraid of labels, but careful of labels, you know, because we are human beings. We're, we're very left brain analytical. We're, we're losing our right brain kind of artistic, you know, allowing things to sort of be the way they're going to be. And I think kids who get the connection, who when you get, give them to the connection the right way, it automatically soothes their brain and they, they're, the ADD go, kind of goes down because what they're doing is they're looking for connection. And what's happened is they've got into video games or they've got into something that isn't feeding them. It's kind of like drinking seawater to quench your thirst. You know, like the more seawater you drink, yeah, it may feel wet and that kind of stuff. But what happens is you excrete more water than you're taking in. So when they go to video games or they go to distraction or whatever, they're excreting more of what they need inside of them, which is the connection, interpersonal connection. And then the less they have that interpersonal connection, the less their brain adapts to wanting it. Mm -hmm. So it rejects it after a while. So when you try and make eye contact with a child, and I don't know if you've done this very often, but seeing an ADD boy especially and trying to make eye contact with them and connect with them, they resist. Like it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. So play is one of the ways of doing that it really and uh, sometimes you know it's it, there's an alpha complex which i don't get into too much but allowing them to be alpha like um, gordon newfeld kind of my mentor in developmental psychology he used to work in a lot of prisons so he would go in and he would uh, and of course the kids weren't going to bond to him at all but what he did was he would talk to one of the delinquents and he would say, hey, you know what? I locked my keys in the car, knowing that this kid knows exactly how to get into a car that's locked. So they would walk out to the, the car. The guy would, you know, jack open the car. And all of a sudden now the kid was in control, right? He was right. alpha at that point. So, right, right. so now at that point, they had a rapport together. So sometimes, you know, allowing your child to be alpha, you know, knowing that they're good at something and kind of letting them take the lead allows you to kind of kind of have that back and forth connection with them because if they feel that you're always like on them and whatever and they have no power they're going to go into sympathetic they're going to go into fight or flight they're not going to be able to make eye contact they're not going to be able to establish their sense of play mm -hmm. and that's what they really need like play out of everything for kids is is just so important and we're losing it and video games are not play they are not they right. do not provide the same you know, when, when I was younger, I played a lot of road hockey. And, when, you know, when I scored a goal or whatever, I was happy. And they could see on my face that I was happy. Or if I fell and scraped myself, I'd be, you know, upset. And they could see that. And we learn how to read other people in play. Because it's the, it's the time that our, our, our brains are, are most open to taking in new information. And we're, we're losing that play sense. So getting back to, to kids with ADHD and that kind of stuff, they've lost their play. They've lost their ability to play. And it's, and it's slowly, you know, drugs aren't going to allow them to get back. You know, it's, it's making that personal connection with them and, and finding stuff that they like to do, which is easier said than done a lot of the time. So I know I'm going on and on and on about oh, this, but fine. I'm pretty passionate about how, you know, it, it, it really is engaging your kids in play. I think that if you could around the dinner table, now the older kids won't go for this because, but the younger kids like have a game where, okay, I'm going to cover my face. And, and I'm going to open my face for a second like this, and I'm going to make a face and I want you to tell what emotion I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. So then you go like this, you go. And the, and the kids will laugh and they'll go, well, you're mad or whatever. It's like that. Good. Right. Okay. Then it's like, it's like, well then, you know, so this is basically play, but it's, it's, it's rewiring their brain to be connected face to face, which is basically what we're losing, which is why we have so much, you know, ADD, ADHD, ODD, all this kind of stuff now. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I find, I find like even just the label like alpha, I just let the kids have leadership, let the kids have some power yeah. in an area that you're okay with. Right. So like my daughter, um, she's got set in the dinner table and she takes the silverware out because that's what she's got at five. We're not gonna let her carry the plates yet. Um, yeah. We've got the 10 year old, uh, both of them will help vacuum. Both of them will help sweep. The yeah. year old, it's his job. We take the trash out. He puts the trash bag back in. So they and the, the daughter takes care of the shoe pile and make it look organized. So it's like, hey, everybody, five minute power clean, and we all have a chat. You know, a challenge, an area that we yeah. can, an area that we organize. 
but we give everybody some power in some area because if, if someone makes a mess of her shoe pile then the five-year-old evie she gets to get on people and say hey fix that i just made yeah. that nice you fix it yeah you're the boss yes ma'am and then we go and we take care of it because then she's got a space that she controls and she has some personal pride in it and it's like oh that looks so great that's awesome high five and so then yeah. we're getting you know the kinetic kinetic reinforcement physical touch eye contact yeah. So, so there's all these little ways that you can just begin to connect with your kids and light them up because they're going to go where they get energy. And if they get energy in a screen isolated, that's where they're going to gravitate. But if they get more from engagement and from interaction, that's where they're going to go to. Yeah. And they need, you know, and, and screens are helpful to a point, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're a very useful teaching tool. And, and, you know, the human brain has this compulsion to learn and there's nothing like the internet. You know, when it used to be like when you and I were having, you know, dinner like 25 years ago and you didn't know an actor in this movie, you were screwed. Like <laughs> no one at the table knew the, knew the actor. Right. You were done. But you were yeah. done. And, uh, you know, and there was no way of figuring it out. But now within five seconds, you can find anything. And that's, that's compulsive to the mm -hmm. brain. You know, it is very compulsive to learn. But by the same token, it's building up, you know, it's like going to the gym and only doing arm curls. That's all you're going to do. So after a year, you've got these huge biceps, but your triceps are nothing, you know? Right. So you need, you need the sort of the well-rounded exercise so your whole system can be engaged and can become, you know, resilient and playful and adaptive. You know, we're losing our kid, you know, Stuart Shanker, who's a professor emeritus at york university outside of toronto says 75 percent of the kids now above 15 years old have an anxiety issue maybe not an anxiety disorder but an anxiety issue right because they, they're losing the ability to soothe themselves so they and they're okay within their own environment at home to a certain extent but you'll see they're addicted they're they're, they're constantly like they're constantly on their phone and when they get hurt or when they when they feel bad they go to their phone that's where they go to Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's an addiction. You know, the definition of addiction is getting a, a small hit of something, but no long lasting satisfaction. So that's what happens. And then they go away to university and the phone isn't working when they get stressed, the, just going to the phone isn't working anymore. So they collapse. So the rates of anxiety in, in, in university students now are massive because they never matured this part of their brain so that they can't act, they, they lose the ability to access that prefrontal cortex to soothe themselves so they can't soothe themselves anymore and the, and the phone stops working and then they collapse. So what should we do as parents to help our kids develop that connection of the prefrontal cortex? Like when is that supposed to click in and what could we do behaviorally or operationally to help reinforce it? Well, it starts at two years old. I mean, it starts, your prefrontal cortex starts developing at two years old. Um, it, it goes through a huge leap when you become verbal at seven and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it's really, it play is a huge factor in, in, in maturing that prefrontal cortex. Interpersonal connection is huge. You know, making eye contact, tone of voice, prosody, you know, all 12 cranial nerves are involved in the social engagement system. So in the human body, the only place where the muscles are attached to the skin is in the face. Mm. And that's why, so we can, we can show emotion to each other. Hmm. but so that's it that's why i said play that game with your kids you Absolutely. know um do the four you know do the four agreements every day it takes you know less than two minutes and it gives them a framework mm -hmm. that they know right from wrong and they can always go back to that and maybe you know we'll post the four agreements in the in the thing at the end because i do that with michael every day you know we go through that every day where did you do your best where did you make an assumption where did you take something personally you know and and it takes less than two minutes and my god the, the amount of changes that that has put into his and and adaptivity it, it's just given him like, like when he gets it when he gets into a, a stressful situation he knows it's like, okay, I'm making assumptions about myself here, or I'm making assumptions about another person, mm -hmm. or I'm taking something personally. You know, like even being aware of it is, is, is so massively important because that mature is part of your brain. Movement is really important, you know, and I, so I'm so glad that you're, you're you know, you, you, you know, martial arts and, and you know, I, I'm a yoga teacher, so yoga, Qigong, you know, any sort of smooth, regimented, uh, regimented movement with breath at the same time that calms our system mm. you know so we're just losing it's, it's it's all about activity 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 all the time and the brain can't it, it will deal with it 
but it, over the course of the long term, it creates this tremendous amount of like hyper vigilance. Like you're always right. waiting for something right. to happen next. And if, and if anything isn't happening, you'll make it happen in your brain. So your brain has to come up with it. So if yeah, your body's lit up. You're almost yeah, getting stuck gotta, with the, you're almost getting stuck with, you've got enough like cortisol and stress hormones in your system that when you don't have them, it's like, this doesn't feel right. This feels weird. I need to go cause more drama. Yeah. And you see that in dysfunctional relationships. You'll see that in you know, kids that grow up in a stress environment. They go and recreate that stress because they don't know what it's like to just be at peace, be still, be calm, yeah. breathe. And they're like, but this is really weird. And yeah. like, I don't know. I don't know what to, and it's like, no, that's actually how you're supposed to feel. You're supposed to feel just kind of even keel and totally calm and chill. And, and that's like, it freaks them out because they're not used to that. They're used mm -hmm. to, you know, Western society. We've got our kids in so many activities. We're doing so many different things. I had a family that came in, they had a six-year-old who was doing horseback riding, violin, piano, lacrosse, soccer, baseball, basketball, football, gymnastics, and then they want to put martial arts in. And I said, no, I can't enroll you. Because when does your child get to be a child instead of a project? And I can't tell you what you want to hear. I got to tell you what the truth is. And the truth is you're doing this kid no favors because at six, they're so leveraged out and you guys are so stressed that by 12 to 15, they're going to be burnt out and not want to do any of that stuff if you're not careful. Yeah. And you know, the thing about human beings is we equate security with familiarity, especially in childhood. So if, you know, if your kid is going bouncing from one to, to another, all these activities, and that's what they're familiar with, that's what they'll reproduce for the rest of their life. They'll always be going from one place to another, mm -hmm. thinking that f what's familiar is secure. And that's not the case in a lot, especially in North American society. You know, I take, I, you know, one of the other things I look at is cartoons. You know, cartoons in the 80s had a frame rate change about every, I think it was seven to eight, I don't have the, the stats right, but I, about every seven, eight seconds, you know, the coyote would, you'd, you'd follow the coyote for seven seconds and then, and then something would happen. And then they would cut the frame rates. They're less than two seconds. Yeah. So, the, the 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 figure's doing this and then it's doing that and then it's doing that so they're training our brains to think so quickly which mm -hmm. which they will do but there is a cost that we pay for that and that's lack of interpersonal connection and that's what happens because interpersonal connection takes a certain amount of time yeah well you also you get a very superficial i think it was malcolm gladwell wrote a book called thin slicing and you get this yeah. quick superficial understanding and then you get kids that are bored because well i already know that i've heard that yeah, but you don't understand it because you got the cliff notes version. You didn't get the actual depth. And that's yeah. one of the cool things we can do in martial arts is we can introduce an exercise. But if one person has more knowledge and experience, even though you heard the same conversation, if you have more knowledge, more experience, you can extrapolate more wisdom out of that experience and you'd be kicking their butt. And they're like, wait, why is he better at this than me? Well, because he's done it more and he's got a deeper understanding. You need to learn what he's doing differently. And the only way you're going to get that is repetition. And so we, we have to create those environments and those opportunities. And so maybe as we go into 2020, families, parents playing along at home, maybe it's worth it for you to look at the activities you're involved in and what are the outcomes you really want for your kids and then pick one or two activities to get them there instead of we have to be busy every single night and we're eating fast food and we're stressed out and we barely get to sit down as a family and we're always running in our screens. Because if that's, that, that's the life we're giving our kids and then at 18, we throw them out into the world, what are they going to yeah. have more urgency and more panic and more drama? Yeah. And the other thing that I read, read we're losing is the family dinner. Mm -hmm. you know, we're losing that because, you know, someone's off at basketball, another person's off at volleyball, you know, you're, so we're, we're, you know, mom's taking Jane to volleyball and dad's taking Bill to basketball and, and, you know, they're grabbing food on the run. You know, Newfeld, Dr. Newfeld talks about that. It's like a child will not take orders or do the bidding for someone who is not feeding them. Mm. So if you're feeding a child, then, the, then they'll sort of, the natural order of things is that they'll take, they'll do your bidding for you. They'll, what you tell them, they'll follow. But if you're not feeding them, or if you're not having that ch chance where you're sitting down and you're actually showing them unconsciously, of course, look, I'm feeding you, we're connected, this is what's happened. Can you be playful around the dinner table? Can you play the, the, the face game around the dinner table? Like, it's just, it's all about human connection. And then once you get that connection and you start building those synapses, then you've got something, as you were saying, as you were just saying, that then you've got something to build on. So right. you, you're building this, this, this social connection system 
And then when they get that again, they're like, oh, they won't may maybe not think of it consciously, but they're like, oh, I'm familiar with this. Yeah, like well, I'll sit with you for a second and we'll talk and we'll really connect here and we'll really sort of do that. But if they have no system to organize that, you may have an invitation from someone to connect, but because you don't have the structure laid down from your family of origin, it'll just go right by you. Yep. Yep. We're having that happen because we have kids now that don't know how to date. They have to app each other. They have to text each other because they don't know how to like talk. They pick, they miss the verbal signals. They miss the, the cues from the body. That's one of the reasons we do a Facebook show. We do a live show every, every Wednesday, 815 Eastern standard, where we eat dinner and we talk about our magic moments. Yeah, and everyone has a chance around the table. I've seen it. It's really cute. Your daughter's so magic cute. Moments. And yeah. the really cool thing is we can go back to when we first started doing it middle of last year and we can watch, you can see Evie getting a little bit, a little bit bigger, a little bit more confident, being a little more patient because at, at four and into five, there's a lot of shifts that are going on and she can watch herself and see that younger version and go, wow, I'm not there anymore. I'm so much further. I'm bigger. I'm smarter, all these things. And, and it's a way to kind of track that, that process as you grow over the course of the year. So it's something I encourage families to do. And we've had messages from people saying, hey, thank you for doing that. I didn't grow up in a healthy, ha in a he healthy home. I've never known how to have dinner without arguing and yelling and all the stuff. Right. And so we model it for them. And, and I, I, it, it seems like such a simple thing to just sit down as a family, eat dinner. But for a large part of humanity, it's actually really complicated and difficult because they've never experienced it. And that breaks my heart to hear that. It's hard, you know, it is really hard to see. And you can almost, I can't remember where I read this, but there was a, you can almost, uh, uh, they, they, they took uh, two groups of people, one who like psychologically had difficulties and they just asked them one question, did you have a family dinner table growing up? Mm -hmm. And like the ones that had the psychological problems, like 80% of them didn't have it. And the wow. ones that didn't, 80% of them did have it. It's wow. such a huge issue. And, and it's so over, I, like I didn't have that family dinner time. We had TV tables, so we would watch the television. So there was no, you know, that interpersonal connection. Like my brother and I played a lot of sports together and stuff. So we were pretty connected, but it, you know, it's just, it's so easy and you can't give what you didn't get too, you know, like unless you do it academically, unless you learn, okay, maybe I didn't have, you know, so for your listeners, you know, if you didn't have, um, a, a family dinner growing up, then make in 2020, start making family dinner. And the kids, you'll be amazed at how they gravitate to it and how much they, they depend on it after a while, mm -hmm. because it makes a huge difference. You know, eating is a parasympathetic activity. You know, there's fight or flight, and then there's parasympathetic rest and digest. So when you're eating, naturally things are calming down. And that's a perfect time to be able to interact with each other because you're in this state of rest and digest your your mind is open and you're 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 able to take in this stuff and then the more stuff you take in like i said you scaffold onto the other stuff the more you learn the more you then the other your other social engagement learning piles onto that and then you start developing this social engagement system and then the kids are able to self-soothe they're able to sort of you know have a sense that they're okay you know and that's and that's what we're losing you know, and then we try and drug, you know, basically, you know, all Ritalin and that sort of stuff is, is it's, it's a, it's a chemical, um, substitute for connection. Mm. That's what it is, you know, and it, it, it artificially stimulates a similar place in the brain that and opiates do this for sure that where there's connection. Mm. So it gives you this sense of connection and, you know, but there's nothing, there's no substance to it. Right. Well, I've seen, I've seen kids, most of the kids I've worked with, if they can play video games, then a lot of times they don't really need to be on much or any medication. They just need some different handling. Um, I have had, I've had two kids that literally could not focus playing a video game. And so they're the, about the only two that I'm like, yeah, they need some medication to help chemically. Yeah. Um, just because they're so, they're just, they can't, they're so play a game and then they're, they're so driven yeah. by their senses, but it's such a rare case. Um, yeah. But it's just families are hard they're hit economically and they both have to work and trying to create time and and you know this is all great in theory but even if you get dinner together as a family once a week saturday night sunday night one is better than none absolutely and you know. it's that's it sets so many good foundations i really appreciate you know you sharing some of the science and just the the, the knowledge behind it because it, it really is such an important thing for families it, it literally is life-changing for our kids it really is because that's, you know, this is where it starts. You know, that's why I, I put so much time into developmental psychology because 
you know, if your development, if your attachment, if your attunement is okay, chances are you're going to manage things without developing a significant mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing that more and more that, you know, mental illness is a, is a, a lack of connection and attachment in children, in childhood or adverse childhood events are leading to mental and physical illness as we get older. And our society is just getting, the, and energetically too, and this is where my, my, you know, as a medical doctor, I want to have a bit of a seizure, but energetically, the kids, we're, we're bringing the kids into this energetic environment that is this peripatetic kind of move from place to place, consumer driven, you know, this, it's, it's, it's short, short lived, you know, get your, get your impulses now, like fix your impulses now. And, it's they're coming into this naturally. This is, this is the baseline that they're coming into. Yep. So of course they're going to be, we're going to have ADD. Of course we're going to have ADHD. So it's our job as parents to kind of go, okay, how can I do the four agreements every day with my kids? How can I make a family dinner? Even if it's just once a week, how can I make eye contact with my kid? Even if it's uncomfortable for them to start, you know, don't force them into it, but just, you know, start with five seconds and make a game out of it. You know, yeah. have a staring, con have a staring contest. Yep. You know, and that make a game out of it. It's so important for our kids, especially the kids under eight, you know, to play and because they'll engage. If you start playing, they'll engage. Um, yeah. And then the older ones, sometimes it's a bit of a fight, but they will too. Yeah. And teenagers will engage too. It's just, you can't come from a place of authority or position or because I yeah. said so you have to like genuinely build rapport because intellectually the teenagers are kind of running the same firepower you are as an adult, yeah. just, just not as much contextual experience and life experience. Yeah. But their firepower is there mentally and they'll call you out on stuff because yeah. you know, I love you, but I don't respect you because I wouldn't make those decisions based on what I know. And yeah. so you've got to get them involved in some of your thought process. But I have, I do, I do birthday parties at my school sometimes and I'll have the teenagers come in kind of the chip on the shoulder. We're too cool for school. But by the end of that, they're running around knocking stuff over. They clean my school without me asking, um, because I, I just get them to engage and uh, give them access to play and I, I acknowledge their strengths and like you said eye contact appropriate touch hit the shoulder high fives and and just getting them to play not from because I said so it's just dude you're here for the next two hours you can make this fun you can make it painful which you prefer exactly. and that's that exactly the way it doesn't bother me I yeah. kung fu and military I'll hurt you either way yeah or we could just have fun which would be more fun you can pay me now or you can pay me later but yeah. that's it. You know, it really is. The human brain is really geared towards play. And we're seeing that more and more, mm -hmm. you know, in therapy, um, just, just everywhere. And then as soon as you engage that, you know, it takes a little while. Like there's a, there's a, a tremendous amount of inertia in not playing. And yeah. as we get older, you know, it happens that way. As we get older, things get kind of like, I've seen this a thousand times before. It's not new to me. Right. You know, so it's like making things that are just genuine and, 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 you know, something that you've seen a thousand times and then just looking at it, and, you know, spending an extra second on it, absorbing the color of it. It just changes the way that your brain handles information. It doesn't have to be, you're not on your, your heels all the time trying to survive. You're actually thriving in an area where you're going and you're telling your brain when you stay, stay an extra two seconds on something, hey, we're okay. Mm -hmm. We're okay. You know, unconsciously, which then, and that's where all our programs are is, is unconscious. So, you know, if you can access that unconscious by just taking a second and just, you know, say, hey, we're going to breathe, you know, and the other thing, oh yeah, that's what I want to say is, you know, if you're, if your child is really like, if they're activated, if they're dissociating, get them back in and like tap their chest, that kind of stuff, uh, put your hands on their chest so that, so the, and just say, okay, just breathe with me. You know, touch is so important for a child because child go, children go into dissociation so quickly, mm -hmm. you know, so touch is really important. Not so much um, verbal, like if a, if a kid is like kind of not tantruming, but really you can see that they're not quite with you. Touch is really, really important because it brings you, sensation brings you into the moment and that changes your brain from survival to, to an area where you can actually sit in the moment that you're in. Right. So breathing with your child is really important and not, and not, and not doing it when they're stressed out. Like just, you know, after, after dinner or something like that, say, Hey, can we just breathe? Just, you know, and just, let's just breathe for like a minute and set the timer and that kind of stuff. And we'll see if we yep. can just hold this for one minute and then just put your hand on their back and their chest and just, okay, that was great. We did it. High fives. And it's just that, that connection, that movement, that breath allows us to move into, you know, autonomic regulation right. and that's what we're teaching them too is is autonomic regulation because 
when you're in fight or flight, it's very difficult to get out on your own. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Yeah, well, you're also dumping adrenaline, so it's going to affect your body weight and your food and how you absorb nutrients and all that stuff. I lived in adrenaline for like 20 years, so I know that life. Um, one of the things too, borrow from Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, call yeah. assertive energy, right? So your yeah. kids or whatever, you're proud of your kids, just touch their shoulder. You can actually create from, from NLP, you can create an anchor that when you like take your left hand, put on your kid's shoulder and just press your thumb a little tiny bit gently in their shoulder. Every time you're like proud of them or you see something nice to them, you're creating a physiological anchor. Yeah. And then when they are stressed, you just come up, put your hand on there and squeeze say, hey, calm down and breathe for a second. Yeah. And you touch that part, you fire off in the brain, and they start to calm down. They're like, oh, hey, I got this now. Um, so there's ways you can teach your kids anchors, and there's all kinds of, of extra tools, but you've got to be in a solid place first. You can't take yeah. people where you're not. That's true. And that's, you know, from a neuroscience point of view, that's a lot of that's oxytocin, too. You know, that connection hormone, you know, when you get a hug, when you feel that touch, that connection, we get this rush of oxytocin, which pulls us way out of uh, fight or flight, oxytocin. Because, you know, back in the, the thousands of years ago, um, you know, you don't get a secretion of oxytocin unless you're safe. Right. You no. Know? And that's just, you know, if you're being attacked by a warring tribe or there's a predator around, you're not going to get any oxytocin. So mm -hmm. as soon as you get that sense of oxytocin, the whole system just kind of comes down. And it's a, great, it's a great trigger point to kind of pull people back into connection as well. Right. That's why they say hugs. And the other thing about hugs that they're showing in, in research is they've got to last about, you know, to really make a difference and really secrete a fair amount of oxytocin. They've got to be at least 10 seconds long, which mm -hmm. is a long, long time, you know, when you're hugging, when you're hugging your child, especially if they're kind of, you know, that sort of thing. But it takes, it takes that long to really spike up that oxytocin and then that will calm them down as well. That's interesting because if you ever do a rear naked choke on someone and do the blood, it takes about eight seconds to pass them out. Yeah. So it's like two seconds longer than that on the positive. That, that's really interesting to me. I'm geek on that. So let me share one thing with you from kind of my world. And then I would like to ask you kind of what's been the best advice you've ever been given. And the thing yeah. I want to share with you is we have a bow in our Kung Fu system. It's like this. And the right hand makes a fist. The left hand makes a palm. And the fist represents the body. It represents the visible world. We call it the tiger. For me in the work that I do with families, I call it games. It's all about our behavior and how we get energy, either through motivation or manipulation. And then the palm represents the dragon. It's the wisdom. It's the invisible world. And then in my work, I call that the stories. So the stories justify the behavior and keep us in those patterns. And then the games is how we actually transfer energy. So we have the body component, the mind component. Then they come together and they touch the heart. And when you bow, you push out because whatever's in your heart in that moment that's what you're going to share. So you have to learn to get that into a peaceful place first. Then once you have it, you can give it out. Because if you don't have the peace here, all you're going to create is more spinning and more whirling dervishes. Sure, yeah, true. I like that. So feel free to say, hey, there's this Kung Fu guy. Show me this thing this one time. And sure. then, yeah. And then what would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever been given that you actually took? For, to read the four agreements. Awesome. Yeah, to read the four agreements, because not only for me did it make a big difference, and I read it about 15 years ago, but I use it, uh, you know, with my daughter, um, I use it with my sons, I use it with my wife, um, you know, and it's just a really great, it's just a really great framework, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not difficult, you know, and we'll post them in, in, in the thing there, but, it, you know, uh, don't make assumptions, do your best, um, you know, every time I try to remember them, I, I, I kind of block out on them and that kind of stuff. And um, take things personally. Take things personally, do your best. Um, I know, but I always kind of block them because I can't seem to remember them in the order that they're, they're there. But I'll post them in the thing because I always tend to sort of, if I'm saying it to Michael, I'll, I'll just do it automatically. But sometimes right. when I'm on the camera, it doesn't, doesn't come. But that's been the best out of, you know, all the things that I've ever, even from neuroscience and that kind of thing, just to be able to do that every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. uh, with him and with myself. It's just a really great, you know, be impeccable with your word. Uh, don't make assumptions, do your best and don't take anything personally. That's all for. Yeah. And, and that's, and basically, you know, you can live your life with that. Yeah. You know? It's a great story to tell because if you it's tell true. yourself that story and this is how yeah. to show up, then it's easier to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then kids, and then, and then it's simple enough that kids can understand it. Mm -hmm. you know? They can, you know, don't take anything personally. If some kid says something about you, you know, don't take it personally. Nah, you know, you, it was them. You, know, you teach them structure so that they don't have to. But mm -hmm. that's probably been the best as far as, 
you know, personal advice, especially to do with kids, you know, because it's simple, they can, they can relate to it, they can have some mastery over it almost immediately. And uh, it's a framework that they can use that can get them out of so many things. So that's what I would say, the four agreements for sure. Well, that is awesome. And do you have any parting thoughts for our families as we go into 2020 to make it the best year of their lives? Yeah, it's just connection. It's just, it's really all about connection. Like life is about connection. It's not about money. And, you know, you, you, everyone's heard this millions of times, but it really is. That's, you know, that brings you into the moment. You know, when you want something, you know, if I look at the, the, the way the brain is structured, we, the brain is, is structured much more to want than to actually appreciate when it has it. Mm -hmm. So there's 90% of our, our brains are devoted towards wanting something and only 10% of a certain nucleus in the basal ganglia actually appreciates it once it has it. Right. So this is why we look at celebrities and they go, oh my God, they must have this amazing life when you know, they've been divorced, they have problems, you know, they have health. You know, we, we always tend to think that, you know, but it's just, it's just really observing the want you know, because in our society, like, do I really, why do I want this? Right. Like, why do I really want, do I think that this is going to make a big difference? Because no matter where you go, there you are. And it's, it's a matter of, yeah, have goals. Absolutely. Have a purpose in life without a doubt. But realize that, you know, you've got to sit in it sometimes. You can't always be moving because when you're always moving, you know, your brain needs to rest and we're not getting enough rest for our brains in this society. And, and that's, what's really, I think, hurting our kids. Awesome. So ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here coming in 2020, take more rest doctor's orders. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. This has been great. And uh, yeah, can't wait to do this again sometime. You got a lot of information, a lot of passion for what you do and love to just get your message out farther and wider. Thanks. Yeah. Just look up. If you want to find me, just look up the anxiety MD, just Google it. A, a lot of my stuff yep. comes up. Yeah. We'll put a link down somewhere sure. here on the video as well. Uh, when we put it on YouTube. It's great talking to you, man. Yeah. It's great talking to you too. Appreciate your time. No problem. We'll talk soon. Mm -hmm. And then.